Welcome to the Two Boomer Women Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. I've been talking to Boomer Women for some time now. I suppose if I really think about it, I've been talking to Boomer Women most of my adult life. And that continues with this podcast, and I must admit, I am loving the conversations. However, there's something else going on at Two Boomer Women these days. I'm interviewing men, too, once a month where possible, and it's called Monthly Man Day. These men have a message for us Boomer Women, and maybe you can interest the man in your life into tuning in, too. Today is Monthly Man Day. Sit back, enjoy, and let me know what you think. Hi, Agnes here. Before we get started on this episode with cannabis and herb farmer and expert Alexis Burnett, I want to explain that I went into this episode thinking it would be, you know, just another great episode. Alexis, however, shared so much great info that I let him talk. The result is a conversation that went to almost two hours. Now, this is absolutely not an issue, as I'm dividing it up into two segments. The second half will air next week. However, Alexis started a cannabis medicine making course this week that you may still be able to join if you're interested. Stay tuned until the end. I've inserted a snippet of that part of our conversation, so you hear a bit more about the course. Now, let's get started. Welcome to the Two Boomer Women Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. Who can believe the first month of 2022 is almost behind us? My guests for the first month of a new year were carefully chosen, and today is Monthly Man Day, and it's a real treat to have a guest I first invited last summer. But between the two of us, our schedules couldn't coordinate until this month. Alexis Burnett is a naturalist, a tracker, we'll get back to that one, an herbalist, and the founder of Organic Grow Canada. He and his family have Rebel Roots Farm, an herb and cannabis farm, and he seems to be so in touch with the land that I'm going to stop there and ask him to tell us more about himself and his farm. Alexis, welcome to the Two Boomer Women podcast, and thank you for making time in your busy life. Yeah, thanks, Agnes. It's a pleasure to be here chatting with you, and uh, I'm glad that the, the stars aligned here early in the new year of 2020. So, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Alexis Burnett, and my wife and I, we run a few different businesses from our small farm here in Ontario. We're on uh, the homeland of the Three Fires Confederacy of the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi people, just south of Owen Sound in Ontario. So we're kind of sandwiched in between Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. So it's a, a very beautiful part of the world to live, and, and we're always grateful for for where we live here. So yeah, there's there's a few, uh, I guess, irons in the fire <laughs> that we, we do here, so to speak. So I run Earth Tracks Outdoor School, and we're actually going into our 18th year of operation. And uh, we're a nature connection school. So we teach people basically how to connect to the natural world. So as you mentioned, I'm a naturalist and a wildlife tracker, and we teach courses on um, everything from natural history and wildlife tracking. We do some wilderness canoe tripping, um, some bushcraft and survival type programs for kids and adults. So yeah, we run a whole slew of, of programs um, with earth tracks. So we run some on, on our farm here, as well as we, we do a lot up in the north uh, in Algonquin Park and Tomogamy area and all over the province, really. Um, so that's one of the things that we do. We also run Rebel Roots Herb Farm, which is my wife's business on our farm here. So we grow probably about 60 different medicinal herbs. Um, we've been on this land for about eight years. And uh, previous to that, we were living in a off the grid cabin on my brother's land. And we, we grew there as well. So I'm a herbalist as well. So I think of myself as more of a community herbalist. So I, I help uh, friends and family and I've been working with uh, plants of all varieties for over 20 years now. And uh, both my wife and I really love growing and working with plants. So we have, uh, we have some greenhouses here and uh, we grow all kinds of herbs, as I mentioned, and vegetables. And we sell to anyone that wants to buy the herbs from us in, in bulk. And we make some herbal products as well. But it seems like a big majority of our business comes from other herbalists as well as people that have natural product lines and are making skincare products and, and things like that. So yeah, it keeps us, keeps us busy. It's nice to, to work with the plants and to be outside and to do things that we love. And 
Um, we have two small children, Violet, who's seven, and River, who's five, that live with us, obviously, here. Um, these days, they're here more often than they used to be. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's the, another thing we do. And then, as you mentioned, in, in 2018, when cannabis was legalized in Canada, I started uh, a, a new sort of venture business called Organic Grow Canada. And I really wanted to just teach people how to grow and use cannabis medicine in um, a safe and in an effective way. Uh, I have been working with this for for well over 20 years as well, but it was really just in the last few years that it was something that I would share with the public a little bit more. But I've seen cannabis work in in amazing ways with everything from uh, a good friend in, in your neck of the woods in British Columbia that had pancreatic cancer. In the late 90s, I lived in, in BC and cannabis was one of the only things that really helped him regain his appetite um, and to help him manage the pain. And, and he chose that over the pharmaceutical medicines that he used. And, and I have many other people that I've, I've just seen cannabis work in, in amazing ways. It's not a panacea. Uh, um, it doesn't heal everything as some sort of marketers would like you to believe, but it definitely helps with the quality of life. And with the lack of quality information, that's part of why I started Organic Grow Canada really was to get um, good information out to the public and to teach people how to work with this plant because it's it's an amazing plant that I sometimes say it's a master plant or a sacred plant that has traveled all over the world and it's been helping people for thousands and thousands of years, at least 5,000 years documented scientifically, but I'm quite sure it's been used for for much longer. So I have a love and a passion for this plant. And it's something that I I really want to share and teach people how to grow quality organic cannabis and then to turn it into um, uh, good products that they can use uh, for health and healing. And sometimes what I found with cannabis is that it it adds just to your your quality of life or it can it can work really well for a number of things. But I, I see a lot of people using it for pain and inflammation. And just to have a better quality of life or to limit your pain is something that can make a huge difference in people's lives. So anyways, I'm just excited to to chat with you today and to share a little bit more about my love for this plant and some of the other things that we we do here on our farm. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. I should maybe let our listeners know that uh, you are not a boomer. You're significantly younger than a boomer. But when I heard you speaking last summer, it was like, oh, my goodness, like I, I know people older than myself, my my generation, who are using some sort of marijuana product, cannabis, cannabis product or uh, CBD. And it's I still don't know a lot about it, even though it's been a fact of my life, I guess, since the 70s. But now we haven't had an opportunity to chat since last summer. So I can't remember if I mentioned to you that I had a career in elder care and each election, federal and provincial, I would hold an all candidates meeting and that would allow residents who couldn't normally get out to to the public ones to ask questions of our local candidates. And this is like late nineties, early two thousands. And even then the residents who were elderly, definitely health compromised would put them on the spot for like, when is this stuff going to be legalized? And these are people who, you know, they're elderly. You sort of think of them as being, you know, conservative or, you know, bah humbug marijuana, but they'd done the research. They knew what they were talking about. Honestly, I think I'm not alone when I say I'm not clear on the differences between, well, the words, there's cannabis, there's CBD, there's THC, there's marijuana. Can you start there? with just explaining all the different words? Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I sometimes joke that almost, you know, everyone and their grandma is interested in, in CBD medicine. So um, I'm not a boomer. I'm, I'm 42 years old, um, I guess soon to be 43. Um, but, you know, you're, you're absolutely right, because there's a lot of interest in, in cannabis. And when I started to teach some classes a, a few years ago in person, I was pleasantly surprised to see that the the demographic of people that were coming to my in-person workshops were usually around 60, 70 years old. And, and there was a slew of people that were a little bit younger and a couple that were a little bit older, but it was, it was refreshing to see that it was people that were coming that really just wanted to learn more. And they had either been using cannabis and they wanted to, to learn a bit more, or they were curious about using it. So I, I see the same thing that you're mentioning here. And 
I prefer to call it cannabis now. Um, marijuana was was kind of a bit of a derogatory term um, that that came about uh, with prohibition and with some of the uh, Mexican people that were moving into the United States. And and cannabis has an interesting history if you look at prohibition and and why it came about. And and I know that's not the question right now, but I just want to kind of start there that it it is a plant that's been used as I said earlier for thousands and thousands of years but it's only been about a hundred years of prohibition in this country so I start by by calling it cannabis cannabis sativa would be its its latin name or its scientific name the THC is um is what is the active one of the active ingredients within cannabis and the the THC is what's responsible for the psychotropic effects so that's what people would maybe call getting high or it's like that that sometimes uplifting sometimes sedative effects often um, are attributed to the THC and THC has many different medicinal qualities Um, so there's many ways that it, it can be used, everything from helping with sleep and managing pain, uh, managing inflammation, headaches, uh, and so on. So that's tetrahydrocannabidiol now, and that's THC. Now, CBD is another cannabinoid, which is found within cannabis, cannabidiol. Now, cannabis has dozens of cannabinoids that are found within it, but THC and CBD would be the the main ones that people know the most about. There's also CBG and THCB um, and many other ones that we're starting to learn a lot more about now that uh, there's a lot more scientific literature and and studies that are are being done. But those are, are two of the main constituents that we find in cannabis. There's also the terpenes, which terpenes are found in many plants and trees in in uh, found throughout nature and and in our gardens and and they're responsible for giving the plants their smell. So that uh, smell that comes with cannabis, if you've ever smelt it, um, you you know that it has a fairly distinct smell. Some people think it's a, a skunk like odor. There's many different types of cannabis, um, various cultivars or what we may call chemovars, um, which is just basically a, a chemovar is looking at at the types of constituents or active medicinal ingredients that are found within uh, a specific cultivar or a specific plant. So the terpenes, though, uh, work synergistically with the cannabinoids, and and they help to moderate and produce a lot of the effects that that we get when when we use cannabis. So there's many different terpenes that are found. There's about 30 that are found in what we would call significant amount in cannabis to be considered therapeutic, but there's upwards of a well over 100 different terpenes that can be found in cannabis. So I hope that helps to kind of start to lay a foundation of the, the ingredients and the constituents that are in cannabis. Uh, maybe I mentioned more than you. you. <laughs> no, it's great. I'm just chuckling here thinking that... Uh... You've just given us cannabis, biochem- biochemical can- cannabis 101, well, probably 401. That's great. No, it's just like I have a whole new respect for both you and cannabis. <laughs> that's, uh, that's amazing. Now, when we started, you said something about, you know, your friend who had cancer. It helped him regain his appetite. I know people who use it for pain. What are some of the other medicinal uses for cannabis big umbrella yeah so there's many ways to use it and i'm sure we'll talk a little bit more later about the different products that can be made from cannabis so depending on whether you're using salves or tinctures or glycerites edibles so mixing your cannabis with with butter there's many different ways than that we can use cannabis many of your listeners may think back to to days in their their youth when they used cannabis um, in the form of joints or smoking and inhalation but uh, Um, And many people still use it in that way. Um, Sometimes we think of uh, inhalation as being more of a breakthrough medication. So if someone's suffering from pain and they're they're a little uh, finding themselves sort of debilitated or the pain is really coming on strong, then then inhalation can be a good method. But I often mention to people that taking cannabis internally is actually probably a better form for uh, a way of taking it for most conditions. 
So as I mentioned, it's definitely being used in many different cancer treatments. Now that's going to be a very intense, maybe not intense way, but it's um, cancers, there's a lot to it. So I, I'm not recommending that you just go out and start using cannabis. Make sure you you uh, speak to your doctor, speak to a qualified nurse practitioner that can help you with that. But definitely many people have had great success using cannabis for things like cancer, um, a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, there's, there's some studies that are coming out that are, are lending support to cannabis being used in that way. So one of the nice things about legalization is now there's a lot of money um, being thrown towards scientific uh, research so that we're starting to find out the more of, of why and how cannabis works. So in the past, many people knew anecdotally that cannabis helps and it works for them, but we didn't always know why. So now we're finding that that there's studies that are coming out each day, daily and weekly, there's dozens of studies almost that come out that are supporting some of the claims that people have known for, for many generations. But definitely helping with things like anxiety, sleep. I've had some friends that use it for um, psoriasis and for various skin conditions when it's used topically. We, we already mentioned pain and inflammation are good ones as well. Um, I use it personally myself for migraine headaches. I find that a little bit of uh, CBD and THC mixed. So a a cannabis uh, variety that has uh, CBD and THC within it uh, definitely helps me very much for, for headaches as well. And if you're interested in learning more, if you go on the Health Canada website, if you probably just did a quick Google search for Health Canada uh, Cannabis, You'll, there's a list of many, many conditions that cannabis can can be used for on the website, and uh, it can help people with eating disorders to regain appetite. Um, so the list is fairly extensive. So I, I encourage your listeners to to do a quick search and onto the Health Canada website because they are um, mentioning things that are backed by some clinical studies as well. So you do have to, uh, as I said in the introduction, it's, it's not a panacea, so it's not a cure-all. There are a lot of multi-level marketing schemes out there um, that have fairly ridiculous claims. So I think your listeners are probably used to kind of reading between the lines, so to speak. So be a little bit leery with that because there's a lot of people that are trying to make money off of it. And anytime that happens, you don't always get the best information. But with that said, it, it is helpful and, and it can work for many, many conditions. It doesn't cure everything per se, but it can definitely help people manage their symptoms. And in, in many cases, it can help to cure um, certain diseases in the body as well. I'm, I'm, I'm going to insert here the quick usual rider that this is a podcast conversation, and if someone's listening, don't say, oh, I've got that issue, and go and buy everything on the cannabis shelf. Stay in touch with your medical professionals and also a professional cannabis person like you. I mean, you obviously have this information and, and knowledge, and I, I appreciate that, but I just want to slip that in there. Now, now, we've talked about the medicinal properties. Can someone get actually high from using cannabis medicinal products? Well, definitely you can. It, it, is a, it is a plant that you want to be, and a medicine that you want to be careful of. You, you want to take some precautions when you take it. But one of the interesting things that, that sometimes people don't realize is that you don't need to get high for it to work medicinally. Now, some people, many people like that experience, just like a lot of people like the experience that comes when they drink alcohol. Now, alcohol is definitely, I think, not nearly as safe as cannabis. There's there's some potential side effects that, that will come from cannabis use, but you don't have to worry about, um, say, overdosing, which you would on, on certain certain drugs or pharmaceutical medicines. So you can't necessarily take too much, but you can experience those psychotropic effects that come from THC that can be uh, definitely impairing. But what I like to mention to, to folks is that when you're using cannabis as medicine, and when you're using it, especially for, for chronic type conditions, it's best in my mind. Now, each condition is going to be a little bit different, but to take it internally. So when, when you smoke cannabis, it enters your bloodstream quite quickly and people will feel those psychotropic effects fairly quickly. When we take it internally in the form of an oil or a tincture, 
it takes longer to enter the bloodstream and its effects will last a little bit longer. But what I like to tell people is you want to find out what your minimum effective dose is. So I call that the MED. And you always want to remember to start low and go slow. So I mean, start low with your dosage. So you're just taking a few drops at a time. And a healthcare practitioner can help you with this. Or when you're if you buy from some of the licensed producers, there's often going to be some recommendations on the label. But what I like to tell people is when you're, let's say, for instance, it might be easier to understand with an example. So if you're taking cannabis, let's say for, um, well, I'll use my own example for a migraine headache. So I can suffer from migraine headaches every two or three months. I sometimes will get them and they'll, they'll come on for sometimes two or three days and they can be pretty debilitating for me. When I feel that that's coming on, I start to take uh, a cultivar that I have that's uh, high in CBD and high in THC. And I take a tincture. And what I tell the people is when you're starting out with cannabis, you just take a few drops at a time until you get to the point where you're starting to feel those psychotropic effects or that quote unquote high effect. And then you back off your dosage a little bit. So within our bodies, we all have what's called an endocannabinoid system. Within our bodies, almost pretty much all mammals have an endocannabinoid system and we produce cannabinoids within our body. Anandamide, the bliss molecule is one that we produce in our body. But then with cannabis, there's the phytocannabinoids that are found within the plant, such as THC and CBD. So when we take those internally, they bind to the receptor sites in our own endocannabinoid system, and they can start to help us with the symptoms. This is sort of an an easier way to understand it. So you don't need to get get high, you just want to have that minimum effective dose, because it's going to be hard for some people to operate if they're not used to using cannabis. They don't want to be walking around high all day. So you want to just take a small amount. Now, some people uh, like the feeling that comes from from using larger amounts of cannabis, and and that's fine too. Sometimes I, I say that, you know, is there a difference between having a glass of wine at the end of the day or using a little cannabis at the end of the day? If it helps you relax and helps with your anxiety and helps you sort of settle into your, your home life and let go of the stress of the day, then I, I, I like to think that that's a medicinal use of using cannabis as well. So I just want your listeners to know that you don't have to get high from using cannabis for it to be a, an effective form of medicine. And maybe just lastly on that subject is that it's, it's, uh, the studies have really found that having a balance of THC to CBD within the cannabis that you're using can produce up to 300 times more beneficial results than using just CBD on its own or just THC. So as I mentioned earlier, THC is what is uh, responsible for giving you the psychotropic effects. And CBD doesn't really do that within your body. You don't have that impairment from CBD. And that's partly why people like seem to kind of gravitate more towards CBD. But just know that having a little THC within that medicine is going to help to to balance it out and to actually be more potent. And you'll probably realize that you have better effects in relief from your symptoms when you use um, a little THC with your CBD medicine. And just to kind of clarify, these are just the cannabinoids that are found within the plant. Cannabis, there's many different varieties, but they, they can have CBD and THC in the same plant, or some plants will have a lot of THC and very little CBD. So when you're doing your research, looking for Um, what we would call a one-to-one cultivar that has the same amount of CBD to the same amount of THC, um, generally is going to be a good place for people to start. I knew I was coming into this conversation sort of out of my depth, out of my league, but it's like, I'm just going like, holy crikey, I had no idea how much I didn't know. This is, this is so great. I'm really appreciating this conversation. I, I did check out your website, and I know you actually train on several different subjects. Let's start with the growing of cannabis. Can people actually grow their own high-quality cannabis at home? Oh, definitely. Yeah, and I really recommend it because, you know, another thing that really interests me and, and what I want to share with with both your listeners as well as our students in our courses is just that you, you can grow very effective, high quality cannabis medicine at home. And then when you turn that into 
medicinal products, be it tinctures or edibles and, um, and so on, you can make these medicines for a fraction of the cost because it's expensive when you buy it from licensed um, producers. Cannabis can be, can be quite expensive. It always sort of has been, and, and I think it will always remain rel- relatively expensive. Um, and you can basically make your own products or grow your own cannabis for kind of pennies on the dollar, so, so to speak. And it can be very effective. And what I also like to mention to people is just that I, I really believe that the cannabis you can grow at home in your own gardens, be it inside your house or outdoors. I always prefer to grow outdoors under the sun. Um, that's definitely my, my preferred method. But when you grow cannabis at home, you, you develop a relationship with the plant. It's maybe similar if, if, you know, let's say you grow tomatoes in your garden. Now, in the summer, when people are bringing their tomatoes, it seems like everyone's trying to give away tomatoes. But there's that saying that nothing tastes better than a homegrown tomato. You know, they're so much better than the ones in the store. And you develop the relationship with your plants as well when you grow them over the year. So cannabis is such a fabulous and an amazingly beautiful plant to grow. And it changes throughout the seasons It's as it comes into flower. What people call the buds are really the flowers of cannabis. That's how they, they reproduce. So all the flowering plants produce flowers and, and they uh, will produce seeds and then they reproduce in that way. But um, when you go through the, the growing season and you see your plants mature, whether it's a vegetable or cannabis in your garden, you develop a real relationship with it. And then when you harvest it and start to turn it into your own medicinal products, that relationship even deepens. And then when you use it to treat symptoms or to um, manage some diseases that you're, you're dealing with, it grows even deeper. And I really think that a big part of the healing journey is a lot more than just taking the medicine. It's about being involved with the plants. It's about growing them, watching them, as I said, grow through the seasons. And that whole relationship brings health. It brings balance back into our lives. So even if, if you're not using cannabis medicinally, it is just a beautiful plant to grow. It, it's, um, there's definitely some tricks of the trade, so to speak. Like it, it's a little different than, than your average tomato, I guess, um, to grow. But I do encourage people to, to try it out and to, to have fun with it. We teach a, a, a course in growing and, uh, it's just such a a beautiful plant to to watch grow. So I really do encourage your listeners to try it out. Um, If you live in a province where it's legal, most ones, it it is legal across the country of Canada, but I believe still maybe the province of Quebec and Manitoba, you can't grow at home. I think that's going to change shortly, but most other places you can usually grow at least four plants and if you're using cannabis as medicine, you can, can get a prescription from a doctor or a nurse, nurse practitioner or some of the various cannabis clinics, and you could potentially grow a few more than your four plants, just so you have a steady supply of cannabis for the year. And maybe just lastly on that topic is that another thing that is really good is that if you find um, beneficial in growing your own cannabis at home is that if you find a cultivar or a strain of, of cannabis, a variety of cannabis that really works for you medicinally, you can grow and you grow it, you can have that same plant for the whole year. Um, Or maybe you have two or three varieties that work well for you. um, And you grow them and you can have a very consistent supply. And it's not always about the most potent medicine, like a lot of heavy cannabis users really want the most potent medicine. But it's really not about that when you're using it medicinally. It's about having a quality medicine, as I said, that is balanced in in THC to CBD ratio. And then uh, it's going to work oftentimes a lot more effectively for you. And if you have a supply that is the same plant that, that you grew, that will last, hopefully last you for the whole year until you grow more the next year. And then you're, because in some of the dispensaries, you'll find that certain varieties will sell out and then you have to try a new one again. So I, I'm definitely a proponent for people to to grow this plant in their gardens because it's, it's a beautiful plant to grow, as I said. And there's that whole relationship that is, uh, is such a positive spinoff from, from growing it from seed to harvest. Now, you mentioned tomatoes, which triggered a thought in my mind, but then you also referred to varieties. And I was going to ask you, you know, whether there was different strains, different varieties of cannabis, and is there a type that is better for medicinal purposes? 
Yeah. So this is an interesting question. And, and I think hopefully this will help some of your, your listeners is that there's a lot of different names of, for cannabis varieties. And some of them, uh, you wonder how they were named um, or where they came from, the AK-47 or the, <laughs> the haze varieties or, you know, blueberries. There, there's all these different, different uh, Royal Sour Kush. There's, there's many different names. Now, in the cannabis industry, a lot of people call them strains. I, I prefer to call them cultivars because cultivar is short for a cultivated variety. So it's a plant that humans have worked with over time and they've cultivated it and bred it for specific characteristics. Now, strains are generally used for bacteria and viruses. <laughs> but, you know, with that said, most people use the word strain. I just prefer to use the words cultivar. Now, a lot of times people think that it's all about the THC or it's all about the CBD. And in, in my mind, it's not so much about the, the percentages or how potent the medicine is. It's about the, the variety of active constituents that are found in it. So they find, have found through research that the, it's actually the terpenes in, in conjunction with the cannabinoids that produce the various effects that you'll find um, or that you'll experience when you use cannabis, either as medicine or recreationally. So on that note, there's many different varieties or cultivars that you can use for different things. So for instance, for things like helping with sleep, it's best to use varieties that are uh, a little more heavy in the THC than the CBD, and also that have terpenes that are more sedating. So there's some terpenes like myrcene, which is one of the most common uh, terpenes found in cannabis that is definitely good for pain and and for sedation. So for helping people sleep. But on the other end of the spectrum, and and another one would be linalool, which linalool is very, is the common terpene found in lavender. And many people may know or use lavender to help them to sleep or to help with headaches because of the the sedating effects. So there's some cannabis varieties that smell a little bit like lavender. So using your sense of smell can really help you in in starting to tell how the cannabis may work in your body when you gain a little more experience. But the other end of the spectrum is there's some cannabis varieties that are more uplifting and more invigorating in their effects. And those plants are generally high in terpenes such as limonene, which we also find in the rinds or the peels of citrus fruit, fruit such as uh, lemons. And that those would be some varieties or even pinene, which is the common terpene found in pine trees. And there's research that's come out. Um, I heard a, a news media on the CBC talking about how it's beneficial to walk in a pine forest on a hot sunny day because the pine trees are releasing this alpha pinene that's uplifting. And, and a lot of people probably can, can sort of close their eyes and imagine when they've walked through a pine forest in the summer and that beautiful pine scent. And that's the, the pine trees that are releasing that alpha pinene that comes in through our olfactory senses or through our nose. And it's uplifting in its effects. So those are some things you may want to look for when you're trying to find some cannabis or a variety or a cultivar that, that may work for you is know that some are more uplifting and some are more sedating. So if you're trying to go to sleep, you don't really want to choose a variety that's high in limonene or even pinene because it may keep you up a little bit at night. Um, and it also, if you're trying to operate in the daytime and you pick a variety that's really high in THC and high in a terpene such as myrcene, it's going to be a little more sedating and then you may get a little bit tired throughout the day. So those are some things to look for. Now, we don't have to get too into the sort of botanical nomenclature, but a lot in, in the dispensaries today, they talk a lot about sativa and indica. So cannabis indica and cannabis sativa. And they talk about cannabis sativa being more uplifting and cannabis indica being a little more sedating. Now, it's not quite as straightforward as that, as I've sort of outlined. It's a little more about the terpenes that work with the the THC and the CBD that will produce certain effects. But know that if you're looking in dispensaries these days, how cannabis is advertised, the indica varieties are going to be a little bit, generally a little bit more sedating, and the sativa varieties will be a little bit more uplifting. But we're starting to get a lot more research, as I said, that I think we're going to see that change. But I just want to share that with your listeners, because that's 
some of the terminology that's pretty standard out there right now. So I, I hope that's that's helpful. No, that's great. Now, do you grow this from like seed or is there like a, a cannabis nursery? Like where would one go to begin in terms of, as I say, is it a seed or do you get a seed like a... a- yeah. Seedling no, great, great it's question. Called. Yeah. Cause sometimes I have to, like, I've been doing this for so long that I sometimes forget the simple things. So yes, definitely a seed. Uh, I always recommend planting from seeds because that's kind of the natural way of, of growing things, you know? So cannabis, it's interesting because cannabis is a dioecious plant. So what that means is that the male flowers are found on male plants and the female flowers are found on female plants. So there's two different plants that could come from a seed. You could have the male plant that produces pollen flowers and you have the female plant that produces the the buds or the flowers that people use medicinally. So it's the female plant that we use. Now, a lot of plants are monoecious, just meaning that there's male and female flower parts found on the same plant. So generally when you plant what's called a regular seed that you would buy, say um, from a seed sailor. There, there's many different seed companies out there. I can maybe mention a couple of them later or, or share a couple of resources. But when you plant a seed, you're going to have generally about a 50-50% chance that it's going to be a male or a female plant. Now, most growers or people growing will get rid of the, the male plants uh, when they start to show signs of their sex, because really they're just going to drop pollen and then your female plants will have a whole lot of seeds in them which is great when you think regeneratively and you want to make seeds for the next generation. But as far as the medicine is concerned, it's best to have what's called cincimelia or just Spanish for uh, without seeds. Um, You're going to have a higher quality plant or higher quality medicine when you don't have a whole bunch of seeds scattered throughout it. Now, when you buy seeds on the market, now maybe I'll just hit that uh, while we're on the topic, is you can buy from... There's many different seed companies out there um, around North America and beyond that you can find on the internet. I I do recommend it, excuse me, if you're doing research on that, that you look for seed companies that have been around for a long time that have sort of a a good reputation, um, or at least that have been around for a long time, because there's a lot of sort of newer seed companies that maybe aren't as reliable, I guess I would say. There's also, you can buy seeds from the licensed distributors. So you can check in at different dispensaries or some of the licensed producers here in Canada. So that's going to be a place where, where you could explore. And then maybe friends and family and people in your community. There's a lot of cannabis people that are sort of crawling out of the woodwork, so to speak. And they're like, oh, wait, I can show myself. Um, uh, so there's people that have been working with this plant for a long time. So you may want to look at your local compassion clubs or dispensaries and and ask around and you may find someone in your community that can share seeds with you. Now, there's also what's called feminized seeds. And this is just a specific breeding process where they, I don't want to go into a huge amount of detail, but they sort of stress the female plant so that the female plant produces a few male flowers and then when it pollinates, you're, because it's lacking the male chromosome, um, you're going to end up with a seed that is 99% or even higher, 99.9%. It's going to be a female seed. So for some home growers at home or people growing for the first time, that could be a viable option to grow, uh, to look for feminized seeds because you know you're going to get a female plant. So if you're only allowed to grow four plants and let's say you plant four seeds of regular seeds, you may end up with three males and one female. But if you plant four feminized seeds, you'll know that you're going to get a feminized plant. So that's definitely an option. And then there's also what's called auto flowering varieties. And these may be some varieties that would work well for people that are growing in their gardens for the first time or people that grow and live in a northern climate for most of us here in Canada and especially in the northern part of the country. Auto flowers basically just begin to flower automatically. So hence the word auto flower. So cannabis in general is a phytophoto dependent. So it just means that it starts to flower when the days get shorter in the fall time. So generally in, in much of Canada, cannabis starts flowering in the, the first week of first or second week of August. And it's hopefully done by the end of September or October. Whereas these auto flowering varieties will just begin to flower right away. So you may, they may be ready near the end of August if you were to plant them in, in May. 
and they're generally shorter and they'll finish up before the the cold frosts and cold uh, wet weather comes in the fall. Um, so those can be some good options for people to grow in their gardens. And then just lastly, there's also what's called cuttings or clones. So just like many nurseries will take cuttings of, of various plants, such as mint and poinsettias and different things like that, and tomatoes, you can do the same with cannabis, where if you have a mother plant, a plant that you really like, you can take cuttings from it and root them. And then you'll have a, a genetic uh, duplicate of that mother plant that, that will grow. So if you know other growers in your area or people that are growing cannabis and they have a variety that you really like or that they like, you may be able to get source cuttings or clones and the licensed producers will sell those as well. Now, I find that the licensed producers, the, the, cut in, the clones they sell and the seeds are, are quite expensive. Then that's why I recommend hopefully you have more people in your local area that can kind of share seeds and, and plants. And it's my hope that, that, you know, cannabis kind of becomes the new tomato in a sense that people are just growing them in their garden. Like, hey, let's grow some tomatoes. Let's put a couple of cannabis plants in and that we start to trade and share just like at least in my community, we're always sharing different vegetable and herb seeds and different varieties of plants, which whether it's squash or pumpkins that, that people like to grow. And, uh, and there's something beautiful about saving your own seeds as well so that you have them for the next generation. This may speak to my personality as much as anything, but you know, as you gave us this information, I'm thinking, I'm not ordering anything off the internet. I need to go in and actually have the discussion, maybe come away and, you know, review what I've written down from your note or notes from you and, and really, you know, really think about it and have the conversation as opposed to just, you know, Oh, into the into the cart into the cart yeah it's, it's interesting so okay so I'm going to move on we've grown our plants what sort of medicines can we make at home because I presume we you you do it we, we must be able to do it definitely yeah yeah you you can and I encourage it I mean, you know as a herbalist I, I said that earlier I've been working with plants for for 25 years now and and one of my favorite things to do is to make medicine products you know to make things you know and I'm a firm believer that there's many things that we can treat from home, you know, whether it's the common cold or coughs and colds and flus, headaches, uh, all those different kind of things that, that uh, we, we don't need to be running to the doctor and we don't need to be popping pills for those things. Often there's trees and plants that grow around us that, that can help to heal us or help to bring balance and health back uh, into our lives. So there's many things that you can make. You know, we, we teach people how to make tinctures would be one. So that's an alcohol extraction or, or your, your macerating or, or putting the herbs into um, an alcohol solution. And the, the chemical constituents are being preserved in the alcohol solution. So tinctures are what you'll find in a lot of healthcare stores when you have a little, usually an amber uh, bottle with a little dropper on the top. And we just take a few a few drops often mixed in with water. So tinctures is a, a really effective product uh, that we can make at home. It's one of the ones ways I, I use cannabis the most and, and herbal medicines a lot. I, I will do that. Now, cannabis isn't great as a tea. One, it doesn't taste that well. And the cannabinoids aren't really water soluble. So it's, it's the, and maybe I'll just hit this point quickly. So on the cannabis plant, they're very sticky and there's what's called the trichomes, which are these resin heads. And within those trichomes is what contains the cannabinoids and the terpenes. So that's the main medicinal part of the cannabis plant. Now there are flavonoids and carotenoids and chlorophyll in the leaves and things that can have healthy effects when used medicinally, but it's mostly those trichomes or the resin heads. And because they're not water soluble, it, they're not effective within a tea. So usually we will extract or, you know, bring those cannabinoids out, off the plant and mix them into a solution such as alcohol or oils or butter. So you can make everything from tinctures. You can make uh, infused oils using olive oil or coconut oil. And when I infuse cannabis in olive oil or coconut oil, usually using a slow cooker method over a number of hours, then I use that as a base for um, sometimes cooking. I can put that into, you know, I can cook my food in the olive oil if I wanted. I can make a, an oil and vinegar dressing. But I generally use it more for the base of salve recipes for salves and creams that I would use topically on the skin. So 
I would use salves and creams for all kinds of skin issues, psoriasis, eczema, rashes, we use it for pain and inflammation. So I think most people are probably familiar with ointments and creams and salves that you're going to use topically on the skin. So those would be some really good ways of using cannabis medicine and some things that you could, you could make with it. You can also mix your cannabis with butter, infuse it with butter. And then the butter is used for a lot of the edible recipes. So a lot of people will cook with cannabis um, and they'll make, you know, everything from brownies and cakes and um, cookies and all these different things from cannabis. And generally they're using a butter an infused butter in those recipes. So when you think when you're, you make a cake or brownies, there's, there's generally it calls for butter. Now, if you're vegan, coconut oil could be a good alternative. A lot of people will cook with coconut oil. So you can infuse your cannabis in, in coconut oil as well. For people that don't like alcoholic tinctures or the, the little bit of alcohol in, in the tincture, you can make glycerites with it. So using a food grade vegetable glycerin, is another nice product that you can make. Um, you can put cannabis into capsules, so you can make your little, like little pills with cannabis as well. And then for things like cancer and things like that, a lot of people will make what's called like Rick Simpson oil or RSO. And that's sort of a involved process where you're just concentrating those trichomes or, or the oil of the cannabis plant and you're using it in, in very high quantity. So I definitely, as you said, to recommend that people speak with a healthcare practitioner or a doctor if you're using it, especially for those more severe conditions such as that. But those are some of the, the many things that we can make. So we can make oils, we can make tinctures, glycerites, we can use it in all different kinds of baking, we can make um, topical salves and ointments and cream. So there's really um, a lot of different ways that we can turn cannabis into really quality, effective medicines right at home in our own kitchens. In case one of our listeners or some of our listeners, probably most of our listeners are, they, they've never used the products. They're cannabis curious, shall we say. So they're, they're going into this still with a little bit of nervousness or hesitancy. Is there like, a, do you recommend a cream to begin or tincture? Like where would they start just to get used to the fact that cannabis. Yeah, I think um, you want to do your research. So you want to find someone that you can learn from or, or a, a website or, you know, definitely it, it's best to learn directly from someone if you can, or at least find someone that you can trust if it's, if it's online. And then, as I said, I think the moniker to really remember is that start low and go slow. So just start with a very small amount of cannabis. And as I said, just start to uptake your dosage just a little bit at a time until you start to, to feel those effects from the cannabis and then taper it off. So each condition is going to be a, a little bit different, but I would recommend if you're, if it's a, a more chronic type condition or something that's a bit more ongoing that you take cannabis internally in the form of a tincture or an oil. Now, I do want to just mention that most of what you'll find on the legal market today that's called a tincture is actually an, an infused oil. It, from the, the herbal world, we consider a tincture um, an extract that's made using alcohol. And uh, an infused oil is one that's made using oil. So most of what you'll find on the market is a concentrated form of cannabis that's mixed with an MCT oil, which is basically a, a fractionated odorless coconut oil that stays in the oil form at room temperature. And they call that a tincture. You know, I, I maybe don't need to split hairs over it, but I, I sometimes do. Um, but taking a, an oral product, ingesting it, I think is a, a good place to start. But be a little, be careful if you're making it into edibles, because you want to make sure you're not overdoing it. A lot of people have a, you know, a, what I call the great brownie fiasco or a story where someone ate too many cookies or too many brownies. Um, now, some people like to eat a lot of those and they like those effects, but other people really don't. So it's important to just get your dosing right. In our course, we teach a lot about, we do a lot of extensive lessons on dosage and how to calculate your dosage. But if you don't know, and even if you do know, just always start really small and just titrate up or just increase your dosage a little bit at a time. And I like to say, because another reason for this is that we don't, you don't want people to have a bad first experience with cannabis because there's 
there's ways that cannabis can really be helpful for a lot of us. If you think about people that are living with pain, there's a lot of people today and, and a lot of your listeners, I'm sure, that are living with, with pain and inflammation in their body. And they're like, wow, I, I want to, I've heard about cannabis. I heard it can really help so-and-so down the block says it really works for them. And so does so-and-so and, and that. So I'm going to try it. And then I'll, if they take it and they take too much, they can have an impaired experience where it's not, it may not be pleasant. They'll get, you'll get through it, but it's not a pleasant experience. And then that may be enough for someone to say, I'm never going to try cannabis again. And then they could really be missing out on it. So on, on a healthy, more healthy life, like if you can just take, like, let's say you're living with a pain threshold of, I don't know, eight, and all of a sudden you start to take a little bit of cannabis and you take it in a moderate way, in a good way. And all of a sudden your pain threshold goes from eight to four. That's a big difference in your quality of life. The way you get out of bed with a little bit of less in aches and pains in your body and how you go throughout your day, that can affect how you look at yourself, how you view your own health. It can affect how you treat others in your family. There's so many spin-off effects. So I just always mention to people, go slow with it, with your dosage and start small. And especially if you're recommending it to people, because we want them to have a good experience. It's not about getting high. Um, it's about returning to, to health. Um, and it's about healing, at least in the, the context that we're talking about today. And when I talked about our, we all have the, what's called an ECS or an endocannabinoid system in our body. So cannabis affects us differently, whereas I may have a higher tolerance to cannabis and I use it more, more than a lot of or some people. I can take more cannabis without feeling those effects or I can manage those impairing uh, psychotropic effects. Whereas someone else may take half of what I take and, and still be, they could really feel those psychotropic effects. So again, just, I can, can't stress it enough, just start low and go slow and try to work with, with someone that, that you trust, you know, that, that can help you kind of moving through. It's really not like super complicated. I'm just sort of mentioning this because you, you want to be, you do want to be, be careful with it, but it is legal to use. And as I said, it's not really about getting high. It's, it's about managing your, your pain or managing your health. So if you just start slow and uh, start low and go slow, um, you shouldn't have any issues. As I mentioned at the beginning, my conversation with Alexis was a long one. This is a good place to divide the conversation. The second half will air next week. Stay tuned for another couple of minutes and listen in as he explains the cannabis medicine making course that started this week. It might not be too late to join if you get hold of him right away. And as usual, all the links are in the show notes. And then I'm getting ready. I probably would have just started our new cannabis medicine making course when this airs. So if someone's listening to this now, you could still probably jump in the program if you want. It starts on January 24th. And in that program, we, it's similar to the growing one that we have live sessions on Zoom that are on Monday nights that are recorded. And then we have uh, somewhere around 20-ish hours. You know, I think the growing course is maybe 40 hours and the, the uh, medicine making is 20-ish hours of, of lessons and handouts. And we basically just, we, we go through a lot of what I talked today in extensive detail. So we talk about the cannabinoids, we talk about the endocannabinoid system, the terpenes. Um, we talk about how to prepare your cannabis for making medicine, how to go through the decarboxylation process. And then we go through making oils and butters and tinctures and glycerites and uh, a lot on dosing and calculating dosage and that. So, um, yeah, and, and that's, of course, we're going to just keep running every year. We generally open it up once or twice a year for new students we have a great engaged online community as well, where people share and ask questions. So we have our own private sort of forum online where people can, I share resources and I can answer questions that people have. And uh, I'm just, I really like the format of it, just how we can be connected online. For, and we have people from all across the country and, and around the U.S. as well and even a few people from further away, but we can uh, connect live and then they can work through the course at their own pace and they have sort of lifetime access so they can go back and watch the videos. And, and that's been, uh, been really fun. Well, 
that ends this this segment of my conversation with Alexis. Uh, if you're interested in that course, obviously he's got to be the best person to teach it. Thanks for tuning in today. Be sure to come back next week and listen to the second half of my conversation with Alexis. We get into kids and cannabis and more into herbs, that sort of thing. And Alexis shares some really nice personal philosophy with us. So, yeah, we'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in today. Mm-hmm.